Uh, today we are going to be drinking gunpowder gin and we will be reviewing Abigail Shire's Irreversible Damage. Uh, today's drink is going to be gunpowder gin as I said. It's actually a really awesome drink. Um, love that sound. I actually first heard about this drink from the Tri Channel which at that time was actually called something else. Uh, I don't remember what anymore. Oh yeah, cheers. Oh, that's so good. That is so good. Irreversible Damage by Abigail Shire was published by Regency Publishing. Abigail Shire is a journalist and a would-be philosopher who has written for the Wall Street Journal and attended Columbia, Oxford, and Yale. The book seems to have several themes and messages, each surrounding the defense of womanhood and the developed self-identity of trans men versus the seemingly transient nature of the assumed identity of trans boys. Uh, the book can be broken down into three parts. The first third of the book is mildly open-minded and relatively good-willed, although completely out of touch with not only the members of the subculture Abigail Shire is examining, but also with all subcultures and countercultures that have rose to prominence or notoriety going back for at least 30 years. The mid third of the book are the most journalistic chapters, of irreversible damage and reads like an extended expose as if she felt she was going to win a Pulitzer Prize for this work while writing these chapters. The back third, the end of her book, is trash. It is all fear-mongering and outrage. All the goodwill that was built up and the genuine reporting that went into the first two-thirds of her book is thrown away in an extended opinion piece that belongs in the same pile of drag that decried Madonna, heavy metal, and Dungeons and Dragons in the 1980s, Magic the Gathering, goth culture, and Marilyn Manson in the 1990s, and even Harry Potter in the 2000s. As if each of these trends or crazes as Shire derogatorily cause them, would lead to the decline of Western civilization, with all the veracity and legitimacy of the hit pieces against the Memphis Three, kids who were later exonerated, found to have been wrongly convicted due largely to media bias against them. But for me, this book most reminds me of the hit pieces against the board game Vampire the Masquerade after the vampire killings of 1996. If all you read was the first half of this book or only seen Abigail Shire's interviews on YouTube, you may think I'm exaggerating. But when the tone of this book changes, it's like the author got pissed off and went all Karen, the soccer mom, on the trans boy she caught flirting with her teenage daughter. The last three chapters, especially, hurt her credibility, and come off as gross and somehow more uninformed than when she started. For this review, I did two things I don't normally do. I reached out to the author for a comment, and I looked up her age. That second part may seem odd, but from her writing, not her YouTube interviews. I got the impression that she may have been from the 1960s. This suspicion came from her apparent lack of pop culture awareness as she didn't know pop terminology dating back at least three decades. But from what I could find, she is my age. So I don't know how she could have grown up so sheltered, not to know nor have been familiar with modern parlance. One example of this pop culture blind spot is she doesn't know what the word pansexual means. For context, my friends and I were using the term 
back when we were 12. That was in 1992, long before the modern internet or social media existed. We learned such terms and their meanings from MTV, Teen Vogue, Seventeen Magazine, and even from HBO's Real Sex series. Where was she all that time that she somehow missed the boat on a cultural revolution? And these were not small publications nor uninfluential resources. For her to confuse pansexuality as a neolingo term, only recently fashionable, created to replace the more maligned word bisexuality, raised the first major red flag for me in this book. There were many others, especially with some of the themes she chose to concentrate on. Little phrases she would repeat seemingly verbatim throughout her book. But truly, it was in the last three chapters where her mask came off. Much like Dr. So's book, each chapter of Irreversible Damage is written like its own extended magazine article, with each successive chapter becoming less about reporting and more about presenting Shire's personal opinions. But unlike Dr. So's book, Abigail Shire clearly lacks a strong grasp of her subject matter or its surrounding terminology, putting her and this book far behind her contemporaries. For instance, of Dr. So's book, The End of Gender, I said that the few negatives were far outweighed by the many positives, while in this book, Irreversible Damage, it has the opposite condition, where in Shire's book, the many negatives far outweigh the few positives. And there are some strong positives to this book. Gold and diamond deposits, but they are mired in shit and buried in thick rough. So what's the good? The best parts of this book and her strongest points are not always on the same page. For the most part, her writing is sharp and verbose, although she sprinkles in some unnecessary German and maybe some French for seemingly no reason other than to show off. But that arrogance does serve her writing style. It gives her opinions and observations an air of authority that would otherwise be absent. Her writing is convincing. And if you didn't know anything about the topic that she is speaking on, you'd assume that she is correct. Her best argument for her stance, and by the end of this book, she does take a stance, whether she intended to or not, whether she realized it or not. She clearly takes a side, and that side is not on the side of the trans activist. Her best argument comes from an extended allegory she makes using the TV show Bones. Extrapolated, her point made here is the strongest in her whole book, that even after you die, we can and will know your sex. To maintain a chosen gender, or better put, to play the progressive's gender game, you'd have to fight biology for the rest of your life, at a high cost. And in the end, after you're dead, you'll lose to DNA, chromosomes, and bone morphology anyway. So what's the bad? Anyone can quote mine the hottest ticks, or most poorly worded statements of any popular influencer from any genre of YouTube, Christian or Protestant, atheist or anti-theist, fashion or movie reviewer, game or comic book reviewer, from playthrough channels to music review channels. And anyone can make any of those groups and its members sound like monsters by doing this type of quote mining. This type of smear is nothing new on YouTube. We do it to each other for drama channels and clout. What's different with Abigail Shire is that she is doing it in print for a mainstream media publication. For me, her biggest mistakes in this book 
are then that she admits to changing and editing the quotes she uses to help with clarity. She'll change elements in her subject's personal stories to hide their identities. She'll openly conflate or condense anecdotes, anecdotes to hinder her contributors' ability to self-identify their own stories. Not so great. And she'll use these conflated accounts as evidence to build her case. And that's where I start having a problem with it. But as we all know by now, anecdotes are not proof of anything. Facts can be forgotten or misremembered. The subject could lie. In fact, each of her subjects openly admit to being biased and motivated in favor of their own side of the story. Memories fade and things can be remembered incorrectly. False memories can be created in the telling or retelling of a story. And that doesn't even take into account perspective and relativity, which can change context and meaning, even if all the hard facts of a story are remembered correctly by all parties involved. Anecdotes are useless precisely because they favor a particular individual's bias, a known logical fallacy that ought to be rejected by a critical or active mind. Therefore, anecdotes are worthless as evidence. Anecdotal evidence based on individual experience and observations ignore probability in favor of lived experience, which can be faulty or based on false assumptions. Some have come to call the acceptance of these ignorant falsehoods unreality, and their promulgation in groupthink a culture of unreality. Then there is the fact that Abigail Shire explicitly states that she is not an expert on the very topic she is researching and reporting to us. Her conclusions, therefore, are speculations at best and hate speech at worst. This book does nothing but raise alarm. And if that is her only goal, to raise awareness in the broader population and to bring this topic to the forefront of the mind of a general audience that otherwise wouldn't care, then Shire succeeds. But only does so by inflaming the tensions between cis, sex, negative feminist, and a large portion of the trans community, mostly against trans boys and the non-binary. And by highlighting the stark differences between a genetic male boy and a generic trans boy, all she does is inflame division. Like so, I think Shire is aiming at the wrong demographic. Throughout this book, Abigail Shire is speaking to parents and grown women, ringing the alarm. She is reporting to this group of cis women as a fellow outsider, speaking loosely about any marginalized group or community. I'm sure the Romans wrote similar things about the Christians, and the Chen wrote similar things about the Mongol Huns. This book does not help her cause. It will only do what so many apologetic books do in religion. It will only speak to the already converted, or in this case, the deconverted, and come off as an attempt to scare off those not yet indoctrinated. Her supporters are writers whom I would recommend you read. Dr. So and Leonard Sachs, for instance, whose books are much better informed and whose research is more reliable, if less emotionally compelling than Shire's book. Her other supporters, such as Ben Shapiro and Joe Rogan, have their own agendas. That doesn't make them necessarily wrong in their assessments, but it does mean that their support of this book amounts to them supporting their own side. 
or supporting themselves. Then there is the religious right, whom have embraced her message wholeheartedly, which is surprising as some of her affirmations are less than kosher. In this book, at least, she seems to affirm feminism, lesbianism, and transition for adults with medically diagnosed gender dysphoria, which has persisted despite non-affirming clinical and psychological therapy, which is fine, but not something the conservative right and traditional religious supporters she has been curating would approve of, almost as if she doesn't know how far right she has moved on this subject. As for her opposition, her opposition is probably her best argument and defense. I've gone to their channels. They seem unreasonable when she is brought up, ideologically possessed and deaf to her most valid questions as well to her more mild ones. This overreaction redeems some of Abigail Shire's more unfair assessments, but if she should come across an activist or trans influencer who is more stoic and logical in their responses, Shire's lack of knowledge on the topics she speaks of in this book would expose the weaknesses in her arguments. Even if Abigail Shire is correct in her conclusions, her opponents would, could, and do easily demolish her arguments by applying the very ready labels of hate speech and transphobia. Sachs and so, heck, even Peterson, are more careful in their wording and word choice than Shire. They make sure to frame their arguments in science and logic, even if they do eventually use anecdotes or emotional appeal as tools to make their points. While Shire only has assumptions, speculations, anecdotes, and emotional appeal to rely on. If this was a high school debate, she'd be flagged for flagrant use of fallacies. And her objectors and opposition would win by default. Rating and recommendation. In the end, this is the weakest of the three books on the current gender phenomenon that I have read. Go read Sachs's book, or go read So's, and skip this book. I did reach out to the author before writing this review to get better context or to help me understand where she was coming from, but I did not get a response. This book is a three out of five. I know that my review may have made it sound like this book warranted a lower rating, but this is not a badly written nor a boring book. But the importance and the severity of the topic matter deserves a more knowledgeable, better informed author. I could change out everywhere she says gender and everywhere that she says trans with words such as goth or video games or marijuana. And I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between her book and the fear mongering anti subcultural screes of bygone eras. All right, that's it. It looks like this will be the format going forward for my channel. Uh, when I finish off some of my lingering series, I'll still be using my old format, but this will be the format going forward. Um, I like it. I like having a drink with you guys. I like having a conversation with you all. Please, please, please subscribe. Um, this will be my last book on gender for a while. Uh, I would like to read some from the opposite perspective. So if you, uh, anyone watching this, knows any uh, popular uh, books that are well-researched uh, and that have good science behind them that go on the opposite side of this argument, please uh, put those recommendations below. I'd love to read them. And uh, it was great talking to you today. I hopefully see you guys next week. Expect uploads once a week uh, as I'm going to start to dial back how often I, I put up videos. So it'll be one video once a week uh, in this format and we'll have a conversation. Um, and we'll be doing mostly book reviews, but we'll do some other stuff as well. And for my one viewer from back in the day when this was a martial arts channel, 
Oh yeah, I'll put some martial arts some martial arts content up at least once a month.